everybody. Happy Monday morning, or at least Monday morning. Morning. <laughs> this is Anne. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host and disembodied voice, Justin, and recently squeaking, but no longer squeaking, Kiri. Um, I hope you all had a great weekend. Hopefully, everybody. I see many wings and Kiri faces in the chat. I'm going to start digging out a color or two. Because Gemstone Dragon has some odd colors on him. Colors that I do not normally use. There. Happily, I have things in a baggie handy. Though I don't remember if I kept Osirian Sand out. I'd like to think I wouldn't have put it away. Aha! I was right. I kept it out. Usually, I don't. But usually, if something is on a uh, live project that I'm still working on, I don't put it away. But you never know; there are days, right? Fluffy bristle. Wow. One, I love your name. Two, welcome. I haven't seen you before. <laughs> Good morning. So everybody, nobody wants to comment on it being Monday. All right, I'm there with you. <laughs> it's been kind of a rocky Monday morning for me. All right, let us go down to Gemstone Dragon. Let's just concentrate on the thing that matters, right? Hey, Polaris, and everybody else, and Roger, 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 what's your vector, Victor? Sorry, airplane joke, had to be made. Um, let's see, that's about where my brain is today, too. Let's see, I think we used some cat's eye green to darken down our dragon a little. And I also used, I think I was using, yeah, ancient oak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for shading. That's right, because I wanted a muted color. Osirian sand, and then we had our... Um, we think we had sunrise orange in that gemstone color. We may also have used lotus orange. It looks vaguely familiar. I definitely was using harvest brown for some of the shading. I'm not sure that I want to stick with that. Looking at it now. You can always adjust. There's never a there's never a time where you know, you can say you can't say, "Hey, I don't like this. I'm going back and doing it again." There's just a time when it will be exceptionally painful because you've already done so much. So my question is, do I like my brown shadows on these gemstones? Hello, Lieutenant Floby. You're new too. Hi. Or, or if you aren't new, you just haven't talked in my sight before. <laughs> I have a pretty good memory for who's talk, who talks and who doesn't. But anyway, welcome. Either way. Monday number one. Yeah, that's the way I feel. And I also wish that I had a coffee, but my intestines are like not liking me because of something I ate yesterday. So coffee is probably right out. Probably not a great idea. All right, let's mix up our colors. So it's been a while since we worked on Mr. Gemstone Dragon. I was thinking about blocking in. I was thinking about color schemes, guys. So, uh, we're working on a, a very, right now it's a very um, kind of analogous color scheme is what they call it. So what analogous color scheme means is that when you look at your happy little color wheel, you are using colors that are close to each other. So right now, if you look, we're using this. And because these colors are all right next to each other, you can see the green, the yellow, and the orange. Um, we call that an analogous color scheme. So essentially you're just sticking over here. Now, because we, we do have green and orange, we do have a darker green that is our shadow, um, and we do have a bright orange, so technically we'd be going all the way out to these points, then we can look at, you know, do we want to add any colors? Because the skin membranes on the wings might be a different color. I could keep them yellow. I could, I could just go yellow with them like I did with his belly. Or I could go with a different color. Um... And a lot of people tend to race toward different colors willy-nilly and get themselves in trouble. But in reality, our yellow is pretty neutral, so we might be able to get away with something. Now, if we were going to add a different color, what would we add? Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Um, so what I was thinking, I was kind of thinking about this morning, because this is really a secondary color scheme is what this is. And when we call, when we talk about the secondary colors, we're talking about orange, green, and purple. Just like uh, our primary colors are red, yellow, and blue, right? So most people know that. Red, yellow, blue, at least, they know our primary colors. And then secondary color, green, orange, purple. So what this means is that whenever you're using green and orange on a model, your obvious go-to is purple. Um, I'm not sure yet, Ify. I'm not sure yet. But what I could probably do is actually use the color that nobody knows how to freaking use in all of creation. I could use Icy Violet. 
see how well that goes with everything? I just stuck it in the frame and already you can see that it goes with this green and it goes with this yellow. So this is a color I could think about using on these wing membranes if I went there. Originally I wasn't going to. Originally I was going to go peachy pink, like more of a flesh color for the membranes. But then I started thinking about it because I, I figured I was having a lot, a lot of this yellow actually stays around. Like, cause you can see the underside of his tail quite clearly over here. And on this side, um, you can see his belly and underside also. So essentially a lot of it was already going to be yellow. Uh, so that's why I was kind of going away from that idea with the wings. But I could go with the violet. I could go. I probably am going to do green for the top side. I tend to always take the dragon's body color and make the top part of the wing a different color than the underside of the wing. Um, just like a bird, essentially, is that's what I'm pulling off. Hey, Mobrock, thank you for the sub. Thanks for the resub. Um, but yeah, so... You can go too many colors with these things. And that's why you kind of want to like back out and say, do we really need that? You know, I could very well go with what I was going to go with, which would have been just kind of a, a neutral flesh color with maybe a little bit of pink in it. Um, just something else. I do want another color, I think, uh, because this because this yellow is is more of a beige. Like it's definitely kind of a... When I look at the stronger colors on here, especially once I add more of the green in, and especially once the back of the wings are green, then we're going to see a lot of green coming on. Right now, we don't have a lot of green. So one of my tasks today, I was thinking, is going to be to block in some more green on this dragon so that we can start to actually see like what our colors really look like. And sometimes you've got to do that because Inara is right. It could be too many colors to go this way. Um, usually, though, Inara, my base rule is... Um, three strong colors on the mini. You can go for a fourth of its complementary. Because this violet is complementary to this yellow, I can go for it. Um, I may, though, get more mileage out of it if I go very light with it. Like, if I actually, I, if I use it, I may actually add white to, to mute it down a little bit. I may even add some Osirian sand to mute it down because then I'm using a color that I'm using elsewhere on the model. Turning it into more of a neutral for the underside of these membranes, and then going up with a pinkish skin color toward the center, like I was originally thinking. So you, you do have to kind of weigh all these things in your head. But it, people don't use the triadic color scheme as often as they probably should. Um, they get kind of caught up in, uh, you know, in like, oh, but then which orange am I going to use? Which violet am I going to use? Your answer is usually in the model and the choices that you've already made. If you're going with a bright color to start with, you probably want to go with a fairly saturated color to, to end with. Whereas here, everything here except the orange, which is more of a spot color at this point, is uh, faded, is, is kind of pastel, right? So that makes sense then. If I go for a purple, I'd also go for a pastel purple. Now, there's contrast to be considered also, but that's where we have the gemstones here. And we'll see if I actually introduce any more darker color on this dragon. I was going not to. I actually was going to go for more of a pastel fall color uh, scheme. And that can be a mistake because you still need contrast. But I figured what I would do is that my contrast would actually come from darker shading. So like putting some of my my darker shadows in here, you know, getting that, getting those dark shadows in can give you enough contrast, even if your color scheme is very kind of washed out and pastel. So these are all the things you juggle. And it's also all the things you especially juggle when you're doing something like a dragon, where it usually is, you know, one color. And a lot of people paint it one or two colors. And it ends up looking extremely boring and you get very sick of whichever colors you picked, right? Because you're painting a dragon for freak's sake. It's huge. Um, yeah. Well, the I did a whole PDF on Icy Violet showing you guys what colors go with it um, back in, gosh like Patreon uh, last year, early last year, I want to say, early to mid springtime, maybe. But Icy Violet was one of the, was the color that people asked for. And it really does go very well with pastel greens, pastel yellows, um, and pastel oranges. So yeah, I think I, I pretty much, I, I put down some, some other colors it goes with in there. But I mean, it's, it's you, what you do though is guys, instead of me handing you the fish, teach yourself to fish. Think about what this is. What is it? It's it's a it's a muted kind of blue violet. You know, it's somewhere between somewhere between here and here. And if we look, color wheel is very good. So let's see here. Adding white. So if we add white to violet, we get a color that's very close 
to Icy Violet. It's just a little bit more blue. So if we look at like a combo of those two colors, that's what we have here. We have those two colors. We might even have like this might, this is actually very close to the, the blue violet plus white swatch. See that? It's blue violet, adding white. There's the result. The result is really, really close to this. So just from doing that, you know that if you then go to your complementary side, this looks very confusing, I know, but but the easiest way is to just go, okay, so the complementary is the strongest arrow. We know that blue-violet is what we were looking at. So now for a complement to it, a color that is not going to fight with it, we go over here and we see, what do we see? We see yellow-orange. What am I using on this dragon? Yellow and orange. In fact, my uh, shading, my shading here for the dragon's neck looks just like some of this. Looks like just like that color. So you can see where I, if I was using this color, I'd be actually using almost the precise complement of it, which means it's going to work. That's okay, Kariniko. All I've been talking about is color. You can go back and watch the first, you know, five minutes and you, you'll have it. <laughs> five or ten minutes. Um, because this is an interesting dragon and he's an excellent example of, of you know, triadic color scheme and all of that. So... So you just, when you're choosing colors, guys, this is where your color wheel is very useful. I mean, because let's face it, if, if you're like, oh, I need a bluish purple that's pale because I'm working with yellow orange, you're going to be like, oh, hey, look, a bluish purple that's pale. There you go. Um, when you are working with pastels, you can get yourself in trouble choosing a really dark color to go with them because it tends not to work so well unless it's a neutral um, with pastels, a lot of it, there's a lot of delicacy in the color scheme. And when you go too far the other direction, especially if you're using it on something very large, you can really clash. So when you're using really delicate, soft pastel colors, do be cautious about that. So like, don't go for nightshade purple, you know, don't go for a really dark. The other problem is that a lot of dark colors are actually very saturated. So trying to put them with a pastel can be a, an exercise in, in futility. Um, so yeah, but these are orange actually in our, maybe the camera is not working very well. Um, the other thing is, and this is what I was talking about, uh, actually was blocking in the rest of the colors is necessary at this point before I make this decision. And the reason is that the orange gems, one, I might be changing the color. As I mentioned, when I started up, I'm no longer sure that I like the brown shadows and I may take them down a bit. Um, but what really matters here is I can get away with this intense of an orange if it's a spot highlight, if it's like, if it's a, an accent color, but if I get too much orange on this dragon's body, then that will absolutely fight with this. I can get away with it. Absolutely. However, and this is the tricky part, right? This is color theory where there are rules and you can break them, but first you must know why they work and you must know how to, how to choose like regular colors. So the fact is there isn't, there are a couple gems up here. So there's a big gem here. There's big gems at the points of the wings. Um, but otherwise, if I was going with this color for the wing membranes and I washed it out, I could even go with an orange and lighten it up for the insides. I bet I can make it, I bet you anything I can make it work because it, because it's a green, orange, purple color scheme. And because I could mute out the orange a bit still, and because of the placement of the orange. So you gotta, it's, uh, I mean, I'll talk more about it as we do this, but right now what we need to do to determine whether this will work, we need to determine how much of this orange is on the dragon and how, how heavy am I going to keep it, right? How saturated am I going to keep it? Right now it's bright. He does, exactly. But a lot of these I may not go gemstone with. Like I was originally thinking that only the largest ones, only the obvious gemstones, because there's a lot of pebbly hide here. That's, that's got tiny little bits on it, but I don't think I was going to go orange with those. It's getting there, Zorblack, Black, but it's got a lot of color theory still to go. And if you really look closely at these gems, you see they're not as saturated as they at first appear. Look at how washed out that looks now. So really, you know, and I did that on purpose. I used a brown to shade it, and I used the Osirian sand partially to highlight it because I wanted to bring it closer to the saturation level of the rest of the dragon. So these are tricks. One second while I get in focus. All right. So like some of this hide, like this hide here that isn't obvious gemstones, that's just kind of pebbly. I'm doing green. I'm not doing it orange. 
I want the gemstones, the orange uh, gems, to really just kind of stand out here and there. I don't want a solid orange hide. I want to paint a green dragon. I just want orange accents. So that is the uh, thing. And of course, for this, I was using the new leaf bud green from Kickstarter, which is not out yet. Um, did anybody ever get an answer on that, by the way, why those colors were on the cancellation list already? Did anybody ever get an answer on that one? Because, you know, the list that went up of the colors that would only be available, is it just because Kickstarter colors are only going to be available on a limited basis now? Or do we, ha do we have an answer on that? You guys remember what I mean when they put out the colors of that they were taking out of uh, standard production and some of the new Kickstarter colors were on that list? Did you ever get an answer on that, Justin? It is a non-production list. I am well aware. I am well aware, Dragon Eye. However, it seems weird to have a Kickstarter color that's not even out yet. That's in non-production. Um, we've never done that before. Okay, so essentially, it's only on the non-production list because it is not in production yet. Um, because I hate to use these colors if they're just going to get taken out of production after the Kickstarter fulfills. You know what I mean? Because there is no equivalent for this green. <laughs> Yeah, I was just curious, John. That's It's just, a, like I said, I, it, it influences what colors I use on the show. So I'd have to figure out how to mix this for people. It would be difficult because it was a hard color to hit. Though I might be able to get... I can get close, probably. So let's block in. I'm going to get my cat's eye green out. I'm going to get my leaf bud out. And I'm going to get my ancient oak out. Yeah, I mean, I wondered maybe if there was another reason. You know, it's just like, what do we got? And I try to only use paints that you guys can get, is the thing. So if we're going to, like, I was using these to promote them, but if they're going to be limited, I need to know that because I want to tell people. I want to tell you to get them now. Let's see, where's my Assyrian sand? Here it is. Yeah, it's Shemstone Dragon. Liquid Nebula. I was feeling draconic this morning. Plus, I want to get more of his green blocked in. So, all right. So, the colors we are using. And as you can see, Cat's Eye Green is, is relatively close to Leaf Blood. Leaf, leaf Blood. Haha. Ha. <laughs> leave it. That's a new one. Leaf Blood Green. Well, it would be green. Um, but you could, you could get close to this just by adding a tiny bit of white and maybe a tiny bit of lemon yellow. So, if we have to do that, we will. So we can get close. Yo, Val. Alrighty. So yeah, so we've got our ancient oak, which is our dark. We all have those draconic days, right, Evan Adams? <laughs> and Monday is usually it. <laughs> um, so, and then cat's eye green. And then the new leaf bud. And then Osirian sand. So, and Osirian Sand, technically, I also added some yellow, too. I believe I was using, I wasn't using lemon. I think I was using candlelight and lightening it. Oh, I don't think I was using NMM Gold, but I might have been. Let me see. Yeah, yeah, actually, it has a lot in common with NMM Gold. So it probably is NMM Gold highlight. Pretty much, right, Skarniko? Yeah, this is the color I used. It figures. I was on a kick with NMM Gold Highlight because it's such a nice soft yellow. And if you're going for a more muted yellow where you don't want it super bright, this is your baby. Um, it is a beautiful, beautiful yellow right there. You can see how well it goes with everything, right? It's just a, it's just a nice punch to the lineup, but it's not super bright. Like if I were to put down something a lot brighter next to it. We're going to talk a lot about color today, guys. Sorry. It's just one of those days. So this, that's much more harsh, right? It doesn't look as good. It doesn't look like it fits as well as this softer NMM gold highlight. Like that is uh, candlelight. 
And it's very orange, so right away it, it doesn't really, you know, it, it's a little bit brighter. It would go okay with our cat's eye green, but not much else in this lineup. It would go okay with the ancient oak also, but it would be very much the accent color to the ancient oak um, because of its saturation. So that's why we're not going there. So instead, if you want, if you're if you're playing with pastel or softer colors, then NMM Gold Highlight becomes probably your go-to yellow. Unless you want to play around with a lot of like mixing your other brighter yellows with white, which you can. Golden Glow would also be a good uh, good pick. I don't think I would go. Um, I wouldn't go lemon here. I would go lemon to mix highlights if I was mixing, like if I was mixing, like I said, with if I if I had to mix this color by using cat's eye, I would go with lemon to highlight green here, but I wouldn't necessarily go with it for like a color on the dragon because you want a little bit of contrast and the fact that this is a little warmer, not as cold as lemon yellow. Lemon yellow is a very, uh, very cold yellow. So if I put a drop of this down next to that NMM gold highlight, you can see the difference. Blonde highlight, not enough yellow in it, Inara. I mean, it could be a good, it's a good replacement for Osirian Sand if you don't have it. It's a little more yellow than Osirian Sand. So then when I put that down, you can you see how green that looks next to this? You can see that it's more of a greenish tone, it's less warm. So your yellows matter, guys. Your yellows absolutely matter. All yellows may look alike to you, but they are not. But yeah, I've got Blonde Highlight right here. So you can see, here, let's put Blonde Highlight down and show people, because this is Color Theory Show. It's Color Theory Show. All right. So yeah, this is really close to a Syrian Sand. It has a bit more brown in it, a bit more beige. It's not as yellow, um, which is actually why I chose a Syrian Sand, is because it didn't have a lot of brown, and I wanted it to mix well with these. When you, when you choose an off-white or an off-yellow, that is golden, but does have a significant portion of the oxides in it. What that does then is that that oxide, that brown oxide or red oxide, what's ever in there, is going to kind of mute itself out against any green that you mix it with. So it's going to dull your green down. And I already have pretty delicate greens, so I don't really want to dull them down any more than I can, uh, than I can help. That said, the, su the change here is so subtle in our, you still could probably use it for a sub, but you might need to like maybe mix a little bit of um, like NMM Gold Highlight into it to warm it a little bit. It is it is a little bit darker too. It's going to dry darker. So you need to use some off-white in there somewhere. Maybe bleach linen or, or I would just use pure white. I tend to use pure white all the time anyway. But yeah. Ah! I had blonde highlight actually out of my desk because I was uh, doing the blonde hair on the Targaryens the other day. All right. So there. Now we can get this guy. These off of my plate. Don't want them to dry there. And I don't want them to mix with my other stuff. So I'm just going to add some water and remove them mostly. And this one I'm just going to shovel off. Shovel. Okay. Grab a paper towel. Or sorry, Kleenex. Boop. I like to keep my palette clean and I don't like to put drops of paint on the upper surfaces and then let them dry. If you don't thin them at all, then that's going to make them harder to get off of your palette. Not impossible because porcelain palette, but still harder. And I like I like an easy cleanup job. Easy, fast cleanup. Roger, colors are all about how they look next to each other. Like, everybody tends to look at, especially when you're a beginning painter, you look at each color individually. Um, when really, what really matters is how they look next to each other. Like, how they change when you put them next to each other. That's why a lot of painters, myself included, will recommend that you just get a little, like, book of, a, a tiny watercolor pad or something. Um, and actually swatch out your colors, like put your colors next to each other that you're thinking of using on your project to kind of see like, oh, that yellow suddenly looks a lot warmer than I thought, or, oh, that green looks so dark next to everything now, you know, that's a thing. Colors are, colors always relative to what it's next to. You can use that. It's a trick that we use all the time in miniature painting, like lining. Well, when you put a line, a dark line between one area of a model and another, you're, you're introducing contrast. It works because it's so different from the colors around it. Like it brings the eye out there because uh, that dark line is so different from what's around it. His eyes are probably going to be orange too. I haven't decided. They could be purple though. I could go there, but I kind of want them to really stand out. So we'll see. We'll see. The eye color is as yet undecided. 
but we're going to block in some greens. And to do that, we needed to thin our green down. And we're going to start with our leaf bud, which is a color that is not terribly high coverage. So if you did want something more high coverage, you could try what I just mentioned and mix a tiny bit of white and a tiny bit of lemon yellow into your cat's eye green. I like the transparency of it. It means that I can blend it very easily. Yeah, see how they dry next to each other. And Nara also has a good point. Um, you will often see color shift with acrylic paints. And a lot of this, this is this is especially prevalent in something that has a, um, a resin that's uh, like a thicker base paint. Um, because uh, the resin can have kind of a, a light blocking quality of its own, a coverage quality of its own. And that can... Um, when it dries, it can shift. If it goes, if it dries more transparent, it can shift the color. Um, the other time you see it is, uh, you especially see this in paints that don't have a lot, a lot of pigment in them. Um, the more pigment a paint has loaded into it, the less shift you're going to see when it dries. But almost all acrylic paints have some shift, just because the um, the acrylic or or latex or whatever resin you're dealing with. Uh, that is the base for the paint has itself some visual qualities. And when that dries to transparency, that's when you see the shift. They, that happens, Lieutenant Floby. So if that happens and it bothers you, like if it, if it, if it impinges, the thing is that usually you still can get a good idea whether they go together. But if that really impinges on your recognition, then what I would suggest is taking out that sheet of watercolor paper and applying a coat of primer to it. Then you can paint over the primer, which is not absorptive, and you should get a very uh, straight up finish and just a light coat of primer. You don't need to saturate the paper or anything. You can also use paper plates for this, guys. Just put a coat of primer down and then paint over it. So all that. In fact, I um, let's see. What am I seeing here? I'm just reaching over for my various things, and I am not finding. There it is. I just noticed a little crack in my primer here that I'm going to have to fix, but we won't worry about it right now. I'll just getting it out so that I can adjust it later. All right. So we've got our green color scheme pretty much laid out. A lot of my greens are highlighted with, um, Osirian sand mixed into my leaf bud green, maybe with a little touch of the yellow there. Although for the most part, if I look at it, it looks like I've mostly avoided, uh, mixing this yellow into that. Mostly that yellow is going to be for the belly of the dragon. So I've got a lot of that blocked in. The problem with having this, uh, this being the actual 3D print is that everything is already put together. So we have to paint these uh, dicey areas underneath the dragon. Luckily from this side, we can usually, we can actually get a brush into most of it. So this shouldn't be too bad. Um, a long, you definitely want a longer pointier brush for this to be more precise. But yeah, that is the problem. Of course, when you guys get the dragon on, in bones, you know, he'll, his feet will be pegging into this rock. He won't have been printed on it. So, uh, so, you know, it'll be a little bit easier for you guys to get, to hit all these places. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, it really doesn't matter as long as you, you really just want to see if stuff looks like it's going to go together. And no matter, even if you get a little bit of shift, you should still be able to make that judgment call of does this look good together? You know, maybe the lightness and darkness isn't even, isn't quite what you imagined, because you are right. It definitely makes a difference what substrate you put um, your paint over. Like, you know, if it's absorptive or if it's not absorptive or, you know, that any of that sort of thing will. And, and it also makes a difference, guys, by the way. Color can shift depending on if you're using it out of an airbrush. Um, so you can find that your color looks a little bit different airbrushed on. So this kind of pebbly scale right here, all these pebbly scales... I'm really wanting to do green and only these big chunks that obviously look like rock. Am I wanting to do with the orange? Cause I definitely want this dragon. You can see that little crack in my primer. I guess I should tackle it. Um, and show you guys how to tackle that. I don't need this guys in, in frame probably. So there's my little crack right there. Um, probably cause I green stuffed the wing and then it uh, bent a little. But, but yeah, so I'm mostly, I want this green. I only want that orange to be accent, uh, the biggest accents. So there's just a couple of like, there's an area, pretty much the big muscles are where you're going to see these chunks of gemstones and as accents at the edges of things. Hey, Valander. 
Yes, in Aria, that is true. A lot of people do glue before painting. They often ask me about it, at which point I tell them, don't. <laughs> or at least base coat it. Base coat it first, guys. That way, at least you've got color in the underneath hard to reach areas, so that if you don't quite reach it, it's not an emergency, right? This is our brush on primer, by the way, so you have to shake the bejeebus out of it, which is why I'm sitting here shaking this thing for this long, which I never shake my paint this long. This is the exception in Master Series to, uh, to the old, you don't have to shake it that hard thing. Uh, and that's because our, uh, the resins that go into the primer are super fine. So they do tend to settle out and you do want to make sure it's really well shaken up. Especially if, like me, you're going to attempt to use it as a gap filler. Because then you want it nice and thick. So you want it well in solution. Because what I'm essentially going to do is try to fill this crack with my primer. By putting it, dabbing it on really, really thick thick and I'll kind of brush it out along and it's nice that this is kind of pebbled around it so that really I only have to put a thick coat on this one chunk of uh, gemstone kind of fill in my gaps some people use sealer for this but our primer in my opinion is a better better filler for this by far hey Anthracia how's it going Yeah, Hudson. Yeah, primer, they tend to go thick with. I mean, it because it's it's they want to get a nice solid coat on, right? So, and with ours, it's not so much that it's like super thick so much as that it's it's really fine. And so when you've got a, a primer that sticks really well, the resin that goes into it tends to be extremely fine. And the finer something in is, the harder it is to get back in solution if it's settled out. Um, that's why the agitator is so important and why sometimes I will actually use a couple of extra agitators in my primer. Yeah, you can use a gloss too, but, uh, the, the problem, the reason I don't use glosses, Valandar, is that, uh, gloss doesn't give you any tooth. So if you're going to paint over it, the gloss can actually make your paint not stick as well in that area. Now, if it's a recessed area, it won't matter. So you're fine. But do be aware of that, is you can get some definite adhesion, post-adhesion properties, um, not ideal. Whereas primer is made to give tooth to paint. It's made for paint to stick to. Now, one thing we do need to worry about is we do not want to go so thick here that uh, it cracks. That can happen. If you put a super thick coat of acrylic down, you can get cracking. That's why uh, it's another reason I thin my paint. But when I'm using something close to full strength like this, I'll often come back and I'll kind of maybe touch it up a little, maybe pull some paint off before it started to really dry. Uh, just the surrounding areas to make sure I don't get cracking. Because if I get cracking, I'm gonna have to go back with a file, take all of this off and start over. <laughs> yeah, there are just some colors that just yeah. Enough said, Hudson, really, right? Uh, yeah, if it works for you up in Adams, really, it's, it's, are you able to get a smooth coat? Are you able to get a smooth finish on it? Are you able to control it so that you don't goop up your model and lose detail? Those are the questions. If you feel you can do that with modeling paste, go for it. I don't. I find it hard to uh, control. I would much rather brush on something that I can use with my brush that has really good control. Um, and honestly, if I had noticed this beforehand, I probably would have just taken green epoxy putty and greened over it. So as it is, I might not be able to fully fill in that crack, although it's actually, it's, it's getting there. But I may actually paint it as a fracture. That's the other thing. It's on a gemstone. <laughs> so it's like, I could make this a feature and not a problem. But anyway, so I'm going to leave that to sit and dry. Uh, the primer does take a little bit to fully dry. So I'm going to paint around it. Because it's, it's on a gemstone, so I can put my green elsewhere. And things like this little line here uh, of like kind of a ridge, uh, I'm not sure that I want to paint that with a gemstone color. I'm going to paint it green to start with, and then I'm going to choose later. You do not have to have all of your decisions made all at once. In retrospect, I could have airbrushed this entire dragon with leaf bud, leaf bud green and then gone back in. But with something like this where a lot of areas aren't going to be the leaf bud green, I like to kind of see it how it develops. Like I like to start 
and then spread out the color and kind of see how it's coming along. So then I can kind of make decisions in transit as it were. And that's just the way I like to paint. If you don't like to paint that way, don't do it. That's a very and idiosyncratic way of doing it. I kind of like to be surprised. Like, so I'm going to paint over that. Um, just leave that big gemstone sticking up. But I, I actually like to be surprised a little bit when I'm painting a model. Like, so I won't necessarily make um, decisions right away. I'll kind of wait and see how it develops. Uh, I don't think that it's, uh, yeah, it's, that's true. As small ones, it can be kind of overkill. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, like I said, uh, I know that paint has trouble adhering to gloss coats. And so I would be reluctant to use gloss, but unless you're going to prime more, as you say, if you're priming over the top, that's different. If you're starting with your gloss, that would be fine. Everybody does it differently is the bottom line, guys. Just because I don't like a product or that I don't get a lot of mileage out of it doesn't mean that you guys can't get a huge ton of mileage out of it. Your painting style is going to be different from mine. And I definitely like have products that I've gravitated to over the years just from experience, you know, with various products. You guys might be more familiar with some of the new stuff, though, because, you know, I've found things. In general, I have found things that work for me. So... When a new product comes out, I'm less likely to try it unless I get a really strong recommendation from a friend. You know, because I might already have a tool that does that, right? A thing that does that for me. I already have a, a work process for that. Which is an advantage that newer painters have. Um, it's a lot of us, not all of us are, are like me. You know, I, I, I just find something that works and stick to it. But a lot of our of the um, established painters still are very exploratory in looking at um, certain products for certain features like that, like gap filling. I just find that it's like, well, what's my best results? And okay, well, I can just do this. So I tend to stop looking there because I'm like, eh. All right, so lots of green, lots of green. I'm just gonna map in the green on this side. I wanna really see and here there's a lot of, this is like a really chunky ridge. So I have to decide if this entire haunch is going to be orange or if only the biggest gemstones are going to be orange on it, right? It's going to change the look of the dragon. Like if I really, if I painted every little chunk orange, this would be an orange dragon and not a green dragon. Um, thanks, Rafter. He's a gemstone dragon from uh, Bones 5 Kickstarter, which is shipping next year. He's a super cool dragon. We're talking a lot of color theory about him today because uh, it's not a usual color scheme. So earlier in the VOD, uh, if you go watch it earlier, uh, I talk a lot about color theory and choosing colors and doing, uh, you know, if I decide to make his wings a different color, what color will I choose? And what do I need to know before I do that? So essentially right now I'm just trying to block in some green because I do want him to be a green dragon, kind of a forest gemstone dragon in autumn. Uh, and only his big gems being, uh, being orange. So... We are working on that right now, trying to figure out how much of the dragon is actually green so that we can make further color decisions. Because I like to kind of decide as I go, that sort. I wanted unusual, Shibi, yeah. Yeah, kind of watercolor dragon. It's, he did look kind of watercolory, didn't he? And we are going light to dark with him for the most part, so. That is in that tradition. There we go. Getting his greens in. So this, I'm pretty happy with this. I mean, he is looking more like a green dragon, which is what I want. Um, so, and I always, the other thing is, even though I'm painting some of this stuff green, if I should decide later that I really need an orange accent somewhere and I don't have it, I can always choose to isolate one of these little chunks and paint it that way. I don't think I will because I've got a really nice uh, distribution. This is a really good um, distribution of, of texture. Uh, so, so really I don't have to really force it, but if I had to, I could. Often the sculptors are good enough, they pay attention to this sort of thing where they have, uh, if they're doing a, an unusual texture like the gemstones on top of the dragon hide here, they'll be good enough to spread it out over the surface of the dragon so that, you know, they're conscious of that sort of thing uh, so that you don't have to worry about it as much. 
So really what I'm looking at here is these look, this ridge here looks a lot more like scales and a lot less like gemstones to me, so I am going to take it green. Whereas the big chunks here on the outside, those are definitely gemstones. And you guys don't have to follow this. You could decide that this entire haunch is gemstone if you wanted. I know that a lot of people do use already painted examples as a guide for what is what. But when it comes down to it, you don't have to do that. Paint it however you like. All right, so these are little gemstones. So let's see here. Do I want to ignore them as I've ignored them in other places? I'm going to block in around and see if I need it. Hmm, yeah, I think I do. I think I need these to be green. The little the little ones I've been been making green all along. So, and I do and I want to break up um I don't want this to be just one giant block of orange because remember it's pretty bright. So if you make it a big giant block of orange and you don't break it up with putting some of this uh, green chunky scales in between it, it's going to be really, really overpowering unless you uh, dim it down. Oh yeah, if you've got, yeah, for sure. If you've got kids who like dragons, they are going to want to paint this dragon because it is one of the best dragons I think we've ever done. Is this a Chris Lewis sculpt? Who's, who did this sculpt, um, Justin? Do you know? Justin is, like, distracticated. John, if you're in, do you know? Hey, Jofer, how's it going? Oh, no, I'm here. I was talking my mic was muted. Christine manual. did this one? Sorry. Okay, yeah. I wondered if it was either Chris or Christine. I knew it was a Chris. Uh, can confirm. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I was in the middle of sending a, an email to, to add. Oh, sure, no problem. Also, John should be on his way back or back at this point with some sort of answer about the paints. Yeah. He said he was going to go directly ask Ed. So. All right, yeah, yeah, we'll see. Well, you know, you, t you ask Ed something and then you get into a conversation about 15 other things. So I totally get it. But yeah, for me, it's just purely a, am I going to promote it or am I not going to promote it? <laughs> if, if Ed decided for some reason it was not that, because, you know, we do have line gluts. So if he decided that new Kickstarter colors are going to go right into special edition, like not normally in, in print, then I totally get it. I just want to know so that I can tell people. It's like trying to use one of the holiday colors. It's like, well, unless I know they're in print right now, I'm, I'm not going to necessarily go there because I don't want to show people something they can't get right away. And like with Kickstarter colors, it's a little bit different because I'm promoting them in advance so that people go and put them in their, in their box. Order them now. Hey, HM Road Dog, thank you for the 13-month resub. I think uh, it's been done before Rapture, way back in the day. I remember there being an Amethyst dragon um, in D&D. &D. I think it was Ralph Partha's AD&D line, and he did. He did actually have kind of a face that looked like it was kind of chiseled out of gemstones, as I recall. He had a very angular face. It was one of the reasons I liked that dragon. Yeah, Amethyst is a... Uh, I'd like to add the case colors are indeed on this because they're not out yet. Once they come into production, they'll move over to... Okay, got it. Then decided on from there as far as how they sell. So, okay, guys, if you want these colors to stay in print once they come out, you gotta buy them. Thanks, John. I appreciate that answer. That's kind of what people were thinking, but, you know, you always want to make sure. All right. Get down, get this tail on. Alrighty, so now we have a nice idea of how green the dragon is. And the answer is quite green. Here, let me get out. So yeah, so actually there's a fair amount of green on this dragon. That tail is going to really pop. Like, I'm going to have to figure out when I get to these really big gems. And it may be um, kind of like a, it's probably going to end up like the head here where I used, I used a lot of the NMM gold highlight to kind of bleach out my orange a little bit here. And I only kept the orange strong in certain areas. 
So let me see. Hold on. <laughs> Finally getting the Kickstarter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's why I thought it was a part of the dragon. I remembered it having the D and D logo. Of course, when they lost the rights to the the um, the license, they uh, could no longer produce it. All right, I'm just gonna block in then the underside of this wing and the top side of this wing, and then we can get into talking about what we want to do with our oranges because the orange is gonna be so bright on some of these big gems. You can tell that I originally thought about making this a sapphire dragon because I've got some blue still blocked in here. But I decided that I didn't want to do that because I was originally going to make him um, a sapphire dragon with kind of like amethyst and uh, like amethyst quartz uh, crystals. So I would go purple, but mostly like pink. So a blue and pink dragon. But then I did the very pinky purple for rock troll and decided I didn't want to do the same color for gemstones on two models. So that's why he is not a sapphire dragon. Yay. And I'm using my big round brush to base coat this, even though it's big. If I was base coating this big membrane area, I would switch to a flat because I could cover a lot more territory. And when we get back here, I'll be switching to a flat. But to do these struts and to do them neatly, I'm going to do a, do a round. Just makes sense to use a large round. So use the brush that you can cover the most territory with but still be neat with is uh, my base coating philosophy. Mm -hmm. Now what I can do here is I can take these smaller chunks and I can make them green instead of orange. And that will allow me to separate out these orange crystals from whatever I'm doing here on the membrane if I want to. Like if, if like Anara suggested, I'm worried about that orange clashing with that icy violet, then putting a layer of this green in between them is a good, a good way to get around that potentially. Having all the skin that leads up to this, just making the biggest crystal orange essentially. And as long as you're consistent with what you do, like here, I definitely only am making the biggest crystals orange. So this is consistent then. The, what I'm doing here is consistent with how I'm treating the entire dragon. And that's what you want to do. You want to make sure you're being consistent across the entire beastie. Um, and then, then it'll carry. Like then people will believe it. Oh, but if you try to switch it up, then it's going to look weird or not look right. Because you'll be like, oh, well, some of these are, are orange and some of these aren't. And... You know, I decided not to do it here for some reason, but I don't remember why and things like that. Um, and then people, you know, can get a little bit whiny because they like don't understand why you didn't do it over the whole dragon. Um, unless you are doing a rainbow crystal dragon where every crystal is slightly different and sometimes you do the little crystals and sometimes you don't. If the whole dragon is kind of random like that, then you get away with it too. That's fine. People won't complain because they're expecting kind of a random dragon. All right little bit extra coat here actually this is covering a lot better than i thought it would given that i thinned it down um, and i know that it has a lot of transparency to it all right so back of the wings dragon butt dragon butt this is just going to be one huge glut of orange back here so we need these wings to be green because you can see how huge this like chunk of orange crystal is going to be so to to counter that I need to make sure there's a lot of green around here to carry that whole effect. And you can see how that, how I've uh, muted out this orange with, uh, by going actually into the NMM gold highlight, this color to both highlight and kind of take it down a notch. So I'm using a brighter orange, but I'm not like depending on that brighter orange. I'm not like, I'm actually using the Lotus orange from, uh, the Kickstarter for this. You can tell it's a prototype bottle. <laughs> you could also use, um, a mixture you you probably I probably would use a mixture of sunrise orange and uh, clear red if you were going to try to duplicate this if you didn't have it um, it's a coral color and we don't have coral colors in the line we used to have one but it got canceled because it didn't sell so I'm taking a chance here on the lotus orange guys if you like it it's really vibrant it's actually a pretty uh, pretty hefty reddish orange and you can see it in action on this dragon so if you like it, make sure you buy it. Otherwise, its life is uh, its its life is um, limited. 
or could be limited. See, now every paint is like on Survivor is what it comes down to, guys. Every paint is on Survivor. Um, so you you have to like uh, make sure that it stays voted in on the island. <laughs> That's a lot of butt crystals. I know he doesn't sit down often. He obviously just lies down if he, right? Yes, it's coral. It's actually a coral color, Chibi. It looks orange on here, but it is actually coral. It's actually the only uh, color that David helped me design. Every once in a while, the, the artists get to design a color. And uh, just because if I'm, you know, if I'm working with them, if they want a special color that we don't make, or sometimes they turn into um, Reapercon colors. The Gothic Crimson was one that Aaron and Lovejoy wanted, for example. And then Corporeal Shadow is obviously Caporia's. Um... Rich green was Jessica Rich's color. So we didn't name the the lotus orange. Uh, we didn't name it like salmon or, or coral because uh, those colors in, in, you know, in the past have not sold very well. But we did decide to make it. Uh, I figured lotus orange would be a good one. Orange Oranges can be useful. So I'm hoping that you guys like these because they're very unusual colors. They're still fairly saturated. Okay, so I'm running out of paint. Oh, noes! Must move quickly. Must thin down some more paint. Forgot I was working on a dragon, right? You need to build a super giant paint puddle when you're working on a dragon. Because otherwise, you just won't have enough. Oh, I've got a hair on my dragon, too. No, dragons are not furry. Kiri. Kiri has contributed to the model. There we go. Awesome. We shall move forward. And remember, see how I'm working, guys. I'm working from one edge across the entire wing. If you do this and you work with thinned paint, you can get a beautiful even coat that doesn't show brush marks because the paint, when you thin it just a little, is going to self-level. And if you're always working against the wet edge, you're never going to get brush strokes. And the minute it starts to dry, leave it alone. But you can work across the wing from one edge to the other and get a perfectly smooth coat. It's one of the things about base coating big surfaces. It's just always start at one end and work across or start at one top start at the top and work down, start at the bottom and work up. Doesn't matter, just start close to an edge. And like an edge meaning this. I mean, yeah, this color might wrap around a little bit. Even if it did though. This is an area that doesn't get a lot of eyeballs. Like people don't look at the edge of the wing necessarily. So you can afford to have a little bit of overlap or brush stroke there. So that's usually where I will start or end is on an, on an edge like that. If it's a, if it's a something that wraps around the entire model, you can see how fast this big flat is letting me cover this area. It's not as precise. I'm glorifying a little bit, but I don't care. I can, if I need to, I can go back and repaint this white anyway before I put anything down on it. And remember, I'm putting in some green up against my crystal. So now we're really, really seeing this as a green dragon. And we'll have, even because these wings are so huge, and I'll let this dry and then I'll put another coat on probably to get a nice solid coat. Um, because these wings are so huge, they're going to be able to counter some of the this huge glut of orange crystals back here. They're going to be able to kind of balance it um, so that the orange doesn't get overwhelming. So, yes, as you, as you go, it's going to change. Putting colors next to each other makes a big difference. Yay. And this is fun. This part of the dragon is fun because you've got a big flat brush and you're just like making this nice smooth base coat and it's pretty and the wings get colored in so fast. I'm having a good time. Can you tell? I needed this. Monday needs to start off with fun dragon wing painting, I think. This would also be a great thing. Obviously, dragons are great things to airbrush if you have the new Reaper Vex or another airbrush. Um... You could use Silly Putty or Poster Tack to mask off some of the things you want a different color and then airbrush the rest. Works pretty well. All right, remember always, again, working against the wet edge here so that I do not get gloppy overlap. 
got to remember to always keep working. If you get distracted and go back, you're going to get a line, a demarcation line. Like I've got, I almost got one right here. I almost went too far, uh, especially with a transparent color. Although putting another coat over the top can often get rid of those. But you really don't want, if you're using thicker paint, you really don't want to stop. You want to keep moving with this wet edge because uh, if you stop when you're using thicker paint, then you're really going to have a problem because not only will you have a line, it'll probably leave a little texture and then that's uh, going to stick. Thinner paint, if you get a line, you usually can cover it over with your with the next coat pretty easily. Which is why I thin all my base coats. Just to get that nice smooth coat. There we go. I'm going to fill in some of this area here. Get these little edges of the wing. There, so now we have gigantic here. Let me back out. Ooh. So now we have a lot of green. So we're gonna, of course we're gonna have to shade and highlight a lot of that green. Oh yeah, this is uh, HM Rodog. This is the gemstone dragon from Bones 5. This is the original 3D print. So yes. Yeah, it's amazingly uh, cheap to buy these at the, on the Kickstarter if you backed originally. I think it's more expensive now, but... Are all of them going to be translucent, Jetty? Jetty Jared? I mean, not that you can't just prime it or, you know, paint over it. And of course, you'll want to probably paint over the base at any rate. Well, geez, if they're going to be translucent, maybe I, like, you know, shouldn't have painted this. <laughs> I would paint a translucent uh, one extremely differently. I do have the Wraith from uh, the Ghoulie bag. I should, I need to get him prepped for tomorrow. I want to paint him for, for this week, for Halloween. You guys are always bugging me to do translucent stuff. Transparent just in, um, like, just, like, generic transparent, like white transparent or a color scrying eye. Is it just going to be uh I mean yeah, if it's white transparent, you could totally use some inks to try to color it or it depending it depends on if you want a quick and dirty gemstone dragon or if you want to actually paint gemstones on it. Clear translucent. Okay. Yeah, so you could paint it any color then by doing some glazes of ink probably. If you just want to if you just want to do it easy, fast and easy. Well, I mean, oh, the translucent bones. It's really, you'll be disappointed, Iggy, because it's very minimal. Very minimal. Because if you put a lot of paint on a translucent bones, you lose the translucent effect. So what you have to do is be selective about. And I think it was, was it, uh, it was, um, who just painted the, the Wraith King on my Patreon? It wasn't Chibi Amy. It wasn't you. It was Miss Dimp. That's right. Uh, she just did one and she was very targeted about where she painted because uh, she wanted to use a light, a glowing LED in it. Um, yeah, you could do that as long as you've got, yeah, so if you've got a spray that works well with the BBC and doesn't react, sometimes finding that can be the hardest uh, part punished to woo because sometimes they do react. But if you've got one, then yeah, absolutely. That's a great, that's how I prime, um, like overwatch statues and stuff. If I'm going to work on a, something that was already painted and I'm not sure how, what kind of a surface it's going to give me with the pre-paint. Cause I don't usually like to strip on something like that. Um, I'll just put a layer of dull coat down cause it has enough tooth. But that also keep in mind that if you use, um, if you use a matte or satin varnish, you can also uh, make the finish look less transparent also. So. Ash, it's not like I don't have more gems to do. <laughs> this dragon's going to be a long time. And also I do gems on the rock troll. So remember all of our stuff, Ash, is, um, is on YouTube. So Reaper Miniatures YouTube. So if you go to search like Mr. Uh, Mr. Rock Troll here, who I did the amethyst gem on. Um, and was doing little gems to show people how to do them here. Um, you can go and watch. If, if you actually search for Gemstone Dragon, you should be able to find the original one where I did this, uh, 
get these gems. Everything we do on Twitch goes up on our YouTube. So, and usually you can search it either the item number or the name of the figure. So this is Gemstone Dragon. That other one is Rock Troll. And I think Rock Troll is 44004 for his number. Don't remember. Um, Justin almost always uses the item number. So we're letting everything dry. All right. Yeah, I, I typically do the item number for the first time we do it. Um, and then every time after that, it's usually just the name. But you're right. The name or the item number will 99% of the time pull it up. However, our YouTube is a our organizational project that is down the road. So if you have any issues with anything, feel free to message me on Discord and I can help you out. So That was Disembodied Voice Justin. Doo-doo. Which I am Reaper Justin on the reaper discord so if you do have any youtube questions or twitch questions like i said feel free to message me um mighty jabberwock uh tamia smoke tamia clears are a little bit weird um they don't they're not great to thin with that you can't mix them with other paints and they usually they require their own thinner but i can't think of why they would react with bones so if i were you i'd just try it on like the base just a tiny bit and see if it reacts if it goes sticky or you smell a lot of weird fumes, then you know not to use it. But I haven't uh, experimented with. Uh, I don't. I think I might have Tamiya clears. I know David has a couple of them. Um, they're good for like creating stained glass effects and stuff. Oh, not good, HM Road Dog. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. We have not only vods on Twitch, but our YouTube gets all of our all of my stuff. So you could go back and watch like two years of me doing this. <laughs> On various models. You could binge watch Anne. You'd probably get terribly sick of me. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, let's base coast some gems here. Let's get this blocked in. Get this dragon so that it's like more. Uh... You want a disembodied voice, Justin Mini? I would have a little. It would be a little speakerphone on a platform. Yes. Many, many good, helpful people here, Ash. So don't worry about it. We, we will answer all your questions, or we will try. All right, I'm going to put down some orange. So once again, I've got my whole uh, selection here. We haven't shaded this yet, but I want to block in some of these gemstones. Uh, you might be able to use some canned air for it if you've got it, HM. But if it's everywhere, then maybe a blow dryer. <laughs> blow dryer to start with, canned air for fine stuff. All right, let's get some. So you see that. Now, this is very vibrant next to the rest of this, but it's still a little bit. It's not, like, super, super intense. So we're still in the okay land here. Hey, there goes to Christmas future. John's head on Sir four scale. Ha. Ah. John, you know, might just be Sir Horskill. Could just be in disguise. Alrighty, so I've got that. I think now, now this orange is very, very bright. This one is. So I'm going to pop a little bit of my NMM uh, gold highlight in there. See if I can take it down a little bit because it's way too saturated. John is secretly for Sir, Sir Forscale. You just guys don't just you just don't know who Sir Forscale really is. All right, lightening it out, pastelling it up, pastelling this orange. Gonna put some Osirian sand in it too. Ha ha! Making it yay, making it work. So then it goes kind of creamsicle on you, and then it's a lot better. Although it's still pretty vibrant, but it is pretty vibrant for some of these gems. So I'm gonna play around with it. This embodied voice Justin is a speaker on a pedestal. Yes. And underneath the pedestal, perhaps within the pedestal, hides Justin. Only you just don't know that. Alrighty. Let's see here what we can do. See, now I'm swinging back the other way and getting back to, like, the brown that I did on, uh, on these gems. Hmm. Hmm. Alright, we've got some orangey things mixed up. Let's go to town. Let's zoom in. Oh, yeah. Well, because I'm doing a lot of stuff, right? And I haven't actually used any of these shades, the green shades, because I wasn't sure. 
salt ore if I wanted to do, um, if I was going to want to do just one small area of the dragon, which would involve shading it also, or if I was going to do what I did, which is block in a lot of the dragon. So that's why I have a lot mixed up on my palette. And then of course the oranges are a totally different set of colors that I'm using. But now that I've got all this, I kind of want to block in some oranges and see how I'm looking here. So I go back and forth. That's a very, very bright orange when I put it on. And then I'm pretty much sure I highlight with that um, sunrise orange mixed with the uh, NMM gold highlight to kind of mute this down a little bit. Uh, I've got those two little gems down there and they ought to be green right underneath. Yeah, there are a few Reaper personality minis. They've appeared over the years. I have so far uh, escaped being a miniature, although my dog has become a miniature twice. Not Kiri, but Leo. Still waiting for the Kiri miniature. The problem is I need somebody to draw her. And the problem is that all the good animal artists are totally stuck up on commissions. Like, they're totally full. So I may just have to bite the bullet and try to draw her myself. If I'm ever going to get a Kiri miniature. Alright. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have a miniature. Jim Ludwig keeps threatening me with it, but again, no art, so no miniature, so I'm, uh, I'm okay with that. I kind of want to, like, have a two-for-one. If they're going to make me into a mini, then I want Kiri as my war dog. So a little bit of this sunrise orange mixture, and I can tell right away that it's uh, way too dark still, and also a little bit too saturated. So what I'm going to do is go go bold and just add a drop of Osirian sand straight to the orange, which is going to lighten it and mute it at the same time. My orange paint puddle is getting pretty big now. So the bigger your paint puddle gets, the less impact a drop of paint is going to have as far as shifting the color. Got to remember that when you're working with it. Yeah, I mean, I would be, if I had my choice, I would be, um, I would be like a Valkyrie or a Viking shield maiden and Kiri would be my Viking war dog. That would be my ideal situation for an Anne mini. Let's see here. Make sure I'm in focus. Don't really need it, Red Links, when I've got this yellow here. Um, I mean, I'm using, if you look real close at this, you can see I'm using yellow in the crystal itself. So I don't really want, um, mostly I'm, I want this orange to be an accent color. I don't want it to look like the skin is changing color as it gets close to the crystal. You could certainly do that um, if that was your concept. That would be cool. It's just not what I'm doing here. I want the yellow to be limited to the belly of the dragon and the inside of the tail here. And I had originally thought maybe the inside of the wings, but I'm slowly considering whether or not to do that. Um, but the, the, the hard thing here now is that this orange is too bright for the screen. So we have to, we have to dull it down. So that's where all those highlights and shadows with muted colors comes in is this, this color goes to become this color. Um, the more you interrupt that bright orange, the more you can get it to, uh, I'm just going to put a second coat over here. I should have anyway, with this loaded Lotus orange, cause I thinned it quite a bit. But yeah. Let me see if I can get it to look like what it really looks like now. Yeah. It doesn't want to, it wants to bleach out. Yeah. That's, that's the color more or less. 
So that's a coral color. Um, for those of you who are like all excited, Chibi and those uh, who wanted a coral. Um, so this is our salmon slash coral color. That is called Lotus Orange for the Kickstarter. So, alrighty, let's see here. And I'm using it as a base for this. So you can see how vibrant it is. Now, another thing to remember is that the green that's around this forearm is going to be shaded with a very muted color, also a darker color, um, which is the oak here. So what I can do right away is I can block that in. Reaper paints clog more than other paint lines. That's interesting because it used to be the opposite. Like I've seen a lot more clogging out of Vallejo than I typically get with Reaper. But um, it could be that we have, um... no, that doesn't make sense either. Yeah, I'm not sure. We filter all our paint. It could be, I mean, it's it's hard to say. I know we had a lot of problems with bottle I, um, bottle uh, QC, where the um, the little apertures and the nipples weren't punching all the way through, and that made it easier uh, for it to clog, right? Because then the, the smallest little thing, I'm just going to block it in this crystal real quick before we go to green again. Um, then the smallest little thing is going to clog if, you're, if your little hole isn't fully punched through. But... I don't know. I don't really get... I, the only time I get Reaper clogs is if it's a paint I haven't used in a long time. Um, and then I've just gotten paint that has essentially dried in like a, a plug of paint that's dried right here at the top. Like if I open my bottle and I see there's like a, a bunch of paint up here, I'll flick it off with my nail. And if I still see that it's filled in in here, that's going to be clogged. So I'm going to punch it out. Um, if I still see that it's, this is filled in, this little aperture. Um, then I know the paint has dried in this upper area. But I don't get that many clogs otherwise, unless my bottle is like almost empty. Yeah, what, I, what Chibi says, you know, if you don't you use your paint for a while. Um, eh. Yeah, somewhat. I don't know, GB. If you want to avoid that, if you're really afraid of that, then um, just take the nipple, just pop the whole nipple out, and just poke it through from the other end. Then you'll poke it out the front of the nipple, and you can replace the nipple, just snap it back in, and uh, you'll be fine. That's what I would suggest if you're afraid of that. I've never been afraid of that that much. Um, paint, all paint is going to latex. All paint is going to, and by, by what I mean when I say that is it's going to get um, some particulate build up as paint dries in where it's exposed to air and either falls into or gets pushed into the bottle. Yes, with a pokey tool, you may cause there to be chunks in your paint. I have really never found it to be a huge issue myself, so I can't speak to that. Let me see, where's my brown liner? I know I was using brown liner for this too. Time to start getting our shadow colors out. Trying to get some some stuff done on shading on this. I'm going to have to wrap up this uh, palette in Saran Wrap to preserve all my colors and we can work on this again tomorrow. Then I'll work on the ghost guy. I was using um, brown liner really, really thinned down as the darkest shadow on my gems. Where you see this really, really dark shadow near the top and also the thin line around the edge of the gem. That's brown liner. John, can you answer that question from Val? If you want to add stuff to the pledge manager and already process the payment, um, do you just do it again or how does it work? Or if you know Justin too. Uh, let's see here. I think you have to. Like if you've already like quote unquote closed out your pledge, can you go back in and reopen it? Uh, reopening? I don't know that you can reopen it necessarily. Like, if you've already processed, right? Like, I've already chosen what I wanted, and I, I you know, I just, like, was like, yeah, right, I this. I think you have to place another order, like Jetta, Jetta said. Yeah. Just get our little shadow in here. See that little thin shadow I'm adding? You can also use this brown to separate all of these different gems. I thinned brown liner, the brown liner down quite a bit, guys, so it still makes a nice 
it makes a good thin line and the line is there but it's definitely more translucent this is where brown liner where the liner color is being translucent um is very useful because i can still get a nice a, a line that's significantly darker but it's a little translucent so it's not jarring it's not cartoony it's just a little thin line that can easily look more natural as i shade So I can get lining, but not harsh lining because so much of this model is so pastel. I don't want big, dark, almost black lines all over it, but I want a little bit of something to separate that gem out. And this is kind of why I wouldn't do a yellow grading up to this orange from the green is that I'm trying to make it look like these, these crystals are really spontaneously erupting. And that's why I'm putting this dark shadow around them to make them look like they're emerging from the skin as separate from the scales. Like they're, they're a different sort of thing. Whereas if you were doing, you know, a green, but then you would do some yellow right before you hit the orange to make it look like they're all like kind of just changing color, I wouldn't do this lining because that's that wouldn't be the effect I was looking for. Yeah, I need to get my storage situation fixed up soon, too. I definitely have a, I have a couple of Kickstarters coming next year, and uh, it ain't going to be pretty. All right, so. And technically, I shouldn't have done that because I should have some, some uh, brighter stuff at the top there. But I felt like putting that color on and seeing how it works. So now I know it more or less works but I don't want it there. <laughs> Recklessly painting without paying attention is what I'm doing right now, apparently. So I'm going to outline my facets with light color. This is a lot like what you do with non-metallic metals, where you are outlining the edge of a sword blade, for example. So you're doing that. Just like you can kind of see all the facets are outlined with white here. So I'm using Osirian sand to start with. And often you can just use kind of the side of your brush if it's a really sharp edge like I did there, but then you can draw it in. Don't worry if you mess it up. This is again, another good exercise to help you build brush control. Anything that requires you to do this, there is just such this tendency to go, oh no, I can't do that. That's too advanced. No, if you never try to do this, you're never gonna be able to gotta practice guys even if you're afraid that it's gonna look bad do it don't be afraid afraid does not serve you in this hobby be brave try things i mean if you don't have fine motor coordination it's something that you can absolutely build this is not something that you are born with it's something you develop it's muscle memory so just because you don't have it right now doesn't mean you won't ever have it, but you have to build it. It's like building muscles. I am... Oh, okay. Similar to the mythical free time. Fear just kills everything. Fear kills fun. If you're afraid of something and you're not going to be having fun with it, and that's just doom. And if you find that you're one of those anxiety-prone people, then uh, there are books out there to help you deal with that. I am uh, working with it myself because I'm, I've gotten very anxious recently just about the Patreon and my stuff that I have to do every month and the pressure have been under a lot of stress. So I have these problems too. I try to work through them. You're a little off screen, by the way, Miss Anne. Yep. That's because I'm so zoomed in. Ah. Uh. 
yeah when you zoom in it's just really hard to stay on screen but i want people to see what i'm doing so it's like i'll try to nail my hand here <laughs> no once you get time and space then neil degrasse tyson comes and tells you awesome you have space time that's what i want like if you could achieve neil degrasse tyson's spontaneous generation by like you know getting both space and time in your life i would work a lot harder at it because i think neil degrasse tyson is pretty awesome and to have him spontaneously arrive when you achieve that would be awesome all right let's see here so that's a very dark one there all right, all right, right. So we need shadows. There is a clear version of this rack. So they just told me that this crystal dragon is going to be clear. Yeah, that's not one of my favorites, Scrying Eye, but I've heard it before. I don't think fear kills the mind necessarily. I think, in fact, it's a function of the mind that we have too much of it. Yeah, yeah. I just have a 3D print. print. This is the, the original 3D print, guys. So That also can be learned, Jabberwock. If you were here, I don't know if you were here at the beginning, but I did talk a bit about color theory on this one. Color theory is something you slowly absorb until it starts to make sense. Much like building muscle memory so you can do fine lines and fine details. Uh, somewhat. Somewhat. Uh, anxiety in particular, which is a lot of what people talk about when they think is fear. I'm actually listening to an awesome book on the brain right now. This is why I'm sharing this. <laughs> but the amygdala is the part of you, your brain, that is more like the primal brain. That's the fight or, f the fight or flight response. But it is responsible for the physical response that you get from anxiety. Um, but you also have the cerebral cortex playing a huge role in your worrying and um, worrying about failing and things like that. So it's both, actually. Anxiety is, is, you know, is the fear impulse. I mean, we wouldn't get anxious if we weren't afraid of bad things happening. But yeah, the, so apparently scientists have found that it's both. That's the amygdala, which is more of your, as you say, your lizard brain. It's on the sides of your brain. There's two, two of them. Um, and then the cerebral cortex. I just started listening to this book on the brain. It's really cool. Because I'm not somebody who's prone to a lot of worry and anxiety, but I've been actually having trouble sleeping lately because of it. So it's like... Yeah, the only thing I fight anxiety with, personally, is 110% uh, of effort. I find that my my brain won't let me get anxious if I know for a fact that I've done anything and everything within my power to to affect change that's that's causing me the anxiety. And I will say I typically stand I don't develop anxiety for things that I can't change. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. My anxiety is entirely about freelance work. Is entirely about getting things done for the Patreon. You know, and so it's it makes sense, right? It makes total sense. It's just you're under I'm under a lot of pressure on that. Obviously, because it's my livelihood. If I fail, then I don't get to buy treats for Kiri. <laughs> you know, it's so it's there's a lot on the line there. Well, that and just like really loving doing this and wanting to keep doing it. So it's weird. I, I also am not prone to, to anxiety or that sort of um, reaction normally. Normally, I'm a pretty, pretty well balanced Anne and I don't have trouble sleeping. So this is a new one for me, which is why I'm doing why I'm reading brain books and figuring out, well, why am I doing this? You know? I find that if I can understand why I'm having the reaction, it demystifies it for me, and then I can tackle it. Yeah, I think the only way I could, I end up developing anxiety <laughs> yeah, is if I get too stressed, maybe. Yeah, yes. Like, there's too much to do, and I can't act on any one thing completely. Yes, I'll turn So then it. it just, it builds up, it just feeds itself, you know? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. And then our brain gets set in neural pathways, because that happens, right? If you have the same kind of thought too often you will continue to have even more of that same kind of thought. So so essentially your brain gets used to worrying, which is even worse because then you've got to tackle that. You know, it's just, yeah, it's it's a vicious circle. So that's why I'm, I'm trying to kind of figure out what's going on. So I'm kind of putting a little bit of uh, flaws and stuff in the crystal. I'm going to work back and forth with some of these oranges to see 
if I can uh, make that work out. I wanted to just kind of mess it up a little bit because when you have a crystal that's not perfectly transparent, which I'm kind of thinking most of these aren't, um, then you're going to have flaws and cracks and uh, bits of uh, modulated color and things like that. Oh yeah, the anxiety. What is it called when you have too many? It's There's a specific name for that, Inara. Yeah, and, and there's a little bit of that. It's just, I don't know, I feel overwhelmed lately. Um, so it's just, you know, learning to fight that feeling, like trying to, trying to address it, trying to kind of, um, I'm a very organized person too, uh, but I think what it happens is that I've taken on a lot recently. So it's, uh, it's like a wave. It's just like, you have to stay on top of it or you go under. So what I'm doing here, guys. Yeah, Ash, exactly. There's a lot of really good books about that is not getting stuck on negative thoughts, trying to, trying to, and with me, it's focusing toward the whole, no, I've got time to do everything. I just have to stay conscious of it and not freak out and not, you know, not get distracted. Yeah. 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 Paralysis, choice paralysis, right? GBD. So paradox of choice, choice paralysis, something like that. Yeah. I'm a big habit person too, like establishing good habits, Jabberwock and stuff like that. Yeah, dread. Yeah, well, they're they're tied, right? Anxiety and dread, right? Up and downs. It's it's like they're very similar. They're cousins, right? Neither one of them is fun. But yeah, it's weird how your brain sabotages you sometimes, and you have to have a talking to, give it a give it a good stern talking to. I'm working on it. I mean, if I want to make make a success of this freelancing, then. I have to find a way to work with it. So making some dark tones um, here and there, mostly opposite my bright highlights, which I'll put in. I need to have a white now. You can kind of see how I did this before. So you're outlining your facets. And then you got to pick out, pick where your, your upright face is, where the light's coming from. For me, that's going to be this one up top here. So then I have to question whether this is, I'm, I'm probably going to have to lighten up this facet a little bit. Um, gemstones are one of the most difficult techniques. If you guys saw that I just put out a te technique, some um, PDF, it's free on my Patreon, patreon.com slash painting big. It's kind of a listing of the painting techniques from the kind of the starters to the end, uh, to like the most complex. Um, and, uh, it's got a section called mechanical techniques and that's pretty much like, you know, base coating, layering, blending, things like that, washes, stuff that just deals with how you use your brush and how thin your paint is. And then there's stuff called conceptual techniques and that's things like doing gemstones, transparent objects, non-metallic metals, shaded metallics, stuff that involves utilizing your mechanical techniques to get specific, uh, effects across. So if you want, go over to the Patreon uh, patreon.com slash painting big and pick that up for free. If you're a beginner, it might help you kind of choose, uh, techniques to work on depending on where you are in your development. Like a, a lot of people don't think about lining, like the dark lining that I did around these gemstones. Um, but I actually include that as, as a technique and I think it really helps to do it, to tackle lining early in your painting career because it gives you better brush control. It builds your brush control so you can then hit details and you learn how to thin your paint to get those thin lines and you learn how to, you know, load up your brush and unload your brush to get those thin lines. So I think that lining is really a necessary core technique, even if you decide eventually never to use it and to just use, you know, dramatic shading instead. It's so helpful in building brush control that I put it very high um, on my list of first techniques to learn. So, like I said, it's a free PDF. Head on over, download it. I do free content every once in a while, so if you want, you can scroll down and see my other free content on the Patreon. Um, I do that so that you guys can get an idea if you like my, you know, my teaching style or think the Patreon may be the a good thing for you. I know there's a lot of, a lot of good Patreons nowadays, so I just trying to find pretty much just make it make it easy for you guys to figure out if I'm one of those patreons that you want to help all right so let's come in with our pure white and uh, get a little bit more of this edge here there so the pure white's really really bright you can see it you can see I'm mostly using it on top on top of the gemstones so the light is falling in a predictable direction so all of the facets that are facing upward um, are going to get this this highlight 
Uh, and this one too, this little one over here, will also get a fairly strong uh, highlight, this little guy here. Oh, cool. Thanks, Saltor. If you get color, color pick paralysis, Jabberwock, pick one. Make yourself pick one color. You can figure out all your other colors using the color wheel from picking one color. So all you have to do is figure out what is the one color I would really love to use on this model and go from there. And remember, with most models, you can always get another copy of it. So it's not like you are forever giving up your chance of painting the model in a different way. Now, I do sometimes get color paralysis if it's a limited edition and I know I'm never going to get it again. <laughs> Her Patreon is awesome. I am not a paid shill. <laughs> Mighty Jabberwock. <laughs> Thank you for saying so. If you use Reaper Master Series, I do think my Patreon might be great for you guys because uh, I think this month I'm going to, or next month I'm going to tackle, um, for the $5 tier, I'm going to tackle the Weird Bones Browns, like Saddle Brown, Nut Brown, and uh, Rich Leather, Polished Leather, because they can be weird browns when you come into it, but they're really useful. And this month I did a skin tone one. So again, kind of blocking in some of these facets, figuring out where's my light coming from. That's going to be the brightest facet before I tackle the other facets. I want to kind of get, get some of these bright facets figured out. And if you want, you can kind of look at the dragon from the top to give you an idea what are the facets that's going to be, you know, facing upward and get the most light. I can see from just that that I need to brighten up these facets right here on the face of this gem. Um, whereas this one, you can see that the edge of this one is more perpendicular. So the shadow, the shadow here is good, but the shadow here is too bright, too strong, too bright. So I've got to dim that down. You need that darkness. You need a bit of darkness to get the effect of being shiny, but you've got to be careful when your surfaces face upward and then your, your difference is going to be between pure white and whatever your kind of medium color is rather than, uh. Yay! Thanks, Up and Adams. Welcome. We have a Discord too. I get feedback and answer questions and stuff on there too. So be sure to join the Discord. And thank you for becoming my patron. Like you guys keep me going. Like totally. Whenever I'm stressing out, like I'm just like, no, no, it's okay. And you have the Patreon, and they love you. So just do your best. But yeah, I totally appreciate it more than I can say, guys. Without the Patreon, I'd be sunk. I'd be looking for a real job somewhere. Being sad. Not that this isn't a real job. I actually worked my butt off. <laughs> Working for yourself is just... You've got to have that I want to work my butt off gene. Paint nerdery, totally. Maybe I should just rename the, the tier, right? Paint nerdery. Abject paint nerdery. Now, I don't want to have too much of a shadow here, but there's a little fracture in the gem here, so maybe I do want to have a bit of a shadow there. <sighs> All righty. So let's see here. Now I want some... I, I do want to get a little bit of darkness, so it's got to be on the bottom parts. But there's also going to be light transmitting through this gem, so I need to bring up a highlight down here. See, that's what we did here on the side of this one. We have a little bit of a shadow here, but it also comes down to light. This is the hardest thing, right? And it's easy when you've got a transparent... When you've got a translucent model and you just leave it that way, obviously that's the easiest way to do this. Um, hey, do subscribe. Yeah, we're working on gemstone dragon. We're really close up with the gemstones right now, but he, this is Mr. Dragon. So I've got kind of a funky autumn-y forest color scheme going in with Mr. Gemstone Dragon. Watching it snow. I wish I could watch it snow, but then if I had to take the dog out in it, I would I would not want that anymore. <laughs> Thanks for the compliment, though, Dungeon Scribe. I'm glad you think he looks good. Um, yeah, I'm doing kind of a weird thing. I like forest dragons, so even though he's a gemstone dragon... I decided I wanted him to be kind of a foresty gemstone dragon. Like autumn forest kind of color scheme. And I often use brighter, more saturated, and richer colors than this, but I wanted to kind of go pastel a little bit with him. Though the gems are still pretty bright. So yeah, we'll block in a little bit of that. But you guys can see how these are kind of coming together. So base color, put your facets in, 
figure out where the top of the gem, where the light's going to fall. Those facets need to be light. And wherever you see things like I did here, where I'm like, oh, the light would still be falling here, you know, remember to make those lighter. So actually, let's go in and do that. Let's go back and make these a little lighter by glazing in some NMM gold highlight mixed with our coral color to bring up that surface and make it lighter. See? Now that's that's reading a lot more like some light is hitting it. Oh no! I'm sorry, Corinico. Yeah, I would hope that it wouldn't just because... Huh, because we have a lot, there are a lot of people in the UK doing Patreon. That's really weird. Maybe I should. I wonder if, if it's debit cards specifically, although it doesn't care if it's a US debit card. Because I have my debit card rigged up for the Patreon, for my, for my other Patreons that I follow. Huh, weird. I'm very sorry it didn't work for you, Karinico. I wonder why that is. I could ask on the Patreon forums... See if anybody else has run into that or their Discord. Depends on the card. Yeah, it's a debit card, she said, Dungeon Scribe. I never understood why some places didn't like debit cards and they liked credit cards. It's like, at least with a debit card, you know you have the money and it's coming directly out of your account instead of spending fictional money. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. All right, so we're lightening up this surface here, mostly toward the outer edge because these facets, if I tip it up, I can see that they hit the light, right? So. And all of these areas that are mostly facing upward, including this little guy up here, um, they all need to be lighter because that's where the light is coming down. For ones that are kind of tilted, like these guys, um, I made them lighter. I'm still keeping a little bit of my shadow there so I get a little bit of differentiation. And uh, new bank or PayPal, yeah. I do use PayPal a fair amount. Um, and then bringing up this facet, the white facet lines, bringing them all the way up to pure white helps to uh, give you the idea that light is kind of gathering in areas in the gem. Like so. And if you find that your line gets a little bit uh, fractured or, or not straight, you're okay. Don't worry about it. Um, especially if you're doing something like I'm doing here where the gemstones are pretty rough and you can see they've got fractures and breaks and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, that'll help. That'll help hide any flaws, any perceived flaws. If you want to, you can kind of also just take a little bit of your NMM gold highlight and uh, kind of glaze it over that area to kind of blend in your white line. Hold on. Mix mix it up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess I did go long, Reaper John. I guess every once in a while I, I try to average out at, like, you know, a certain number of hours per week, which is about an hour and a half a day, but I wanted to actually get to some of this uh, gemstone stuff. So, yeah, so you can take some of the yellow and just kind of blend it over this line. Just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of paint. And that blends it in, and suddenly it doesn't look ragged anymore. You're good. So there we go. Oh, Visa or MasterCard. All has to do with how much our card services. Uh, I see. Bummer, scrying eye. So yeah, maybe PayPal is the way to go then. Bank and trying to buy off foreign sites. Yeah, security stuff. Hey, DL Pancake. You would have to raid right when I was trying to wrap it up. <laughs> oh, dear, dear, dear. So hi, DL Pancake and party. This is, I'm Anne. I work for Reaper. Uh, obviously, since we're reading Reaper Miniature Switch. Um, and we're working on the Gemstone Dragon from Bones 5 today. And later later this week, we'll be working on a transparent model. Um, a transparent plastic model for Halloween. Um, but yeah, so we're working today on this guy and blocking in more of his green and getting some of these gemstones kind of figured out um, so that we could progress. 
so yeah, I was painting, uh, if you go back and catch the VOD or also this will eventually end up on YouTube, um, you can see how I'm working on all these little gemstones. Uh... <laughs> I'll go check it out, Zeltor. I'll be checking Discord after this. Yes, but welcome. Welcome, readers. I'm about to tie, I'm about to tie it up, but uh, if you have any quick questions, reader peeps, just go ahead and ask and I'll try to answer them as I kind of put in some more highlights down below. With a gemstone, it's transparent, so light is going to be going through it, which means you do actually um, highlight the underside where the light would be pooling. Mm-hmm. Looks like, looks like not a lot. Nobody, nobody with questions yet. So we will start to wrap up. Anybody else? Anybody else got any questions? Any weirdnesses? Any uh, random comments? Otherwise, we will uh, begin to wrap it up, and I'll tell Justin to look for a raid himself. Sorry to bounce uh, bounce you guys around from uh, DL Pancakes uh, stream. So I'm going to put a little white highlight. I'm going to outline all the facets with white. And that will help carry that feel. I actually already have a uh, raid ready. Oh, do you? Who are we raiding, pray tell? We're raiding someone new today. Um, to the I don't I don't think she's new to painting or new even to Twitch. Um, she's just someone new to uh, our new to us. Good. Which, yes. Good. New to us. Um, but she's doing. Looks like she's doing some base work right now. But she was painting an orc earlier. All right. Cool. Um, but yeah, say hello. Uh, I, she, I, I know she knows who Reaper is. Oh, okay. Um, can she mentioned it earlier? But say hello for us. Yeah, guys, go know? say hello to a new person. Like new people, rating new people is always awesome, especially if they could use the views. Um, so be sure to like give her a hello and hang out for a little bit. Help her numbers. Alrighty, I will uh, talk to you guys tomorrow morning. Probably a little more gemstone dragon tomorrow, and then we'll switch to the wraith, the translucent wraith, later in the month. So have a good one. I hope your your first Monday of the week uh, goes well, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you guys very much. Um, let's see here. Uh, we will see you this afternoon for Miniature Monday. Hopefully it goes off. Uh, he's having some issues with, like, uh, there's an ice storm up in Oklahoma, apparently. So we will uh, hopefully hopefully we'll have Miniature Monday on schedule today with no issues. But it don't be surprised if, if it is not, uh, just as a forewarning. But uh, hopefully I'll see you guys this afternoon at 3 p.m. Central. Thank you very much for coming out. Keep being awesome. And as always, spread the Reaper love.